Oh 
Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. My name is Marcus Ray Hauck. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I serve as the Director of Music Ministries for this congregation. It's good to be with you once again. If you're watching this service live on Facebook or YouTube, we invite you, as always, to share your name and your location in the chat and let us and each other know that you are here. The closing hymn we're going to sing today is going to be Blue Boat Home, and I know it's beloved by many of you. Our member Judy Ranierson in a service a couple years ago gave testimony about how Blue Boat Home was her very favorite hymn. And we haven't sung it in a while, but when you hear the tune, you're probably going to think, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Didn't we just sing this? Yes. On Easter Sunday, we sang Hail the Glorious Golden City, which uses the same tune. And there are two other songs in our hymnal, again, using the same melody. One is Years Are Coming, and the other one, Earth Was Given as a Garden. But today, Blue Boat Home, with the most recent text by Peter Mayer. First, though, we're going to sing For the Earth Forever Turning, a love letter to the planet that sustains us. The hymns today will be led by our member, Jessica Burr. i 
Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever age, ability, history, identity, gender, or sexual orientation, you are welcome to bring your full self here. I'm Laura Thomas, and I use the name Laura as a pronoun. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. Today's service, titled Fragile, an Earth Day Prayer, seeks a more reverent relationship to the Earth, exploring our fragility and that of our planetary home, while examining how environmental justice intersects with other injustices, like race and class. If you have school-aged children, please register for our amazing, enlightening, empowering children's religious education program. As a teacher, it's an honor to have your children here, and if you haven't sent them yet, please do. If you're joining us at 10 a.m., please continue with us for a virtual Connection Cafe beginning at 11 a.m. It is time to light our chalice, a beacon to guide us through these times together. Perhaps you have a chalice or candle at home, anything that you can illumine. Let's light our collective chalices as we share our chalice lighting affirmation. Let us open our senses to take in the beauty. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Today's invocation comes from the poet Joy Harjo. Oh, sun, moon, stars, our other relatives, peering at us from the inside of God's house. Walk with us as we climb, naked, but for the stories we have of each other. Keep us from giving up in this land of nightmares, which is also the land of miracles. We sing our song, which we've been promised has no beginning or end. Called now by this invocation into worship, we turn to seek a soft meditation, a deep reflection, an ardent prayer, each as we are called yet mystically all together. And we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the requests, and the remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. And the voice that you'll hear sharing our remembrances will be intern Ali Casey Bell. Roz Gohagan lights this candle for her cousin, Jamie Daniels Robinson, who died on April 5th at 103. Roz and Jamie spoke weekly. Roz's first memory of Janie's was of her generosity to Roz with the gift of a bracelet when she was only three. Janie survived by her son, Stephen, two grandsons, three great-grandchildren, and several nieces and nephews. Amy Haynes lights a candle for her father, John Sincock, who's entering hospice this week after battling cancer and emphysema. Amy and her family were able to spend time with her father during these last few weeks together. Please hold Amy and her family in your love. Catherine Kempf lights a candle in memory of her father, Arthur Kemp, who died on April 7th, 2021 in Los Angeles. Catherine is grateful he no longer suffers in pain. Lauren Carlton lights this candle for a workmate of nine years, Agnes Carson, who died last Sunday. Agnes had lots of funny stories was infinitely patient and always had a positive thing to say about everyone. Lauren hopes this candle lets her know she's thinking of her. We light this candle in sorrow and outrage at a police involved killing of a black man. We lift the family of Dante Wright in our prayers. We hold the Brooklyn Center, Minnesota community in care and responsibility as they determine how they will account 
for the injustice of this stolen life. We light this candle in sorrow and outrage, learning of another police shooting of Adam Toledo, 13, who was killed by police in Chicago Thursday night. We also witnessed a video of a soldier in South Carolina assaulting a black man. Holy One, we need to dismantle white supremacy. It's never been more evident than it is in this morning. Bring us hope and real change soon. We light this candle in sorrow at news of a mass shooting at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Prayers for the families of the slain and for that community. Help us stem the tide of murderous rage and easy access to weapons of mass destruction for the violent and the unhinged. We light this candle to celebrate our own Kira Pipkins as she made history as a wrestler by becoming the first athlete in Bloomfield history to capture two state individual titles in any sport. Way to go, Kira! We light this candle to honor the three-year anniversary of the installation of Reverend Scott and Reverend Anya as co-ministers in service to our congregation. At the end of this congregational year, our congregation and our senior co-ministers will have been joined together in ministry for four years of challenging and beautiful work. We light this final candle for the joys and sorrows that have not been spoken aloud. In the silence that follows, you are encouraged to speak the names of those you are holding in your prayers or meditations or to write them into the chat. May we hold this silence as this silence holds us. May our listening bring forth acts of love. Join me now in a spirit of prayer and meditation. Oh, sun, moon, stars, or other relatives peering at us from the inside of God's house, Walk with us as we climb. Be with us as we seek to elevate our understanding of the world that we inhabit. Help us to keep the fires of righteousness burning whilst also keeping us from burning out. For we know this work is unceasing. Spirit of life. Be with us as we hold on to each other through the natural phases of life each bringing their special joys and sorrows. And hold us. Hold us in these times, in these times when we know we, black and brown, indigenous people know we, Women and differently abled people know. We, Jewish people know. We, trans, gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, queer people know that it has been open season on us in this country as long as this country has been a country. Hold us, hold us in this time where it is so easy to get a gun. Where it feels like 
Extermination is a foregone conclusion. Hold us in these times when people want to explain away the reasons why the system is broken and why children the children should be killed for mistakes. Hold us in these times where traffic stops equal death and sleeping equals death and cleaning your yard equals death. This has been a heavy week that reminds us that we are not safe. We were never safe. We were not meant to survive. But here we are. Spirit. So when the burden seems too heavy, Remind us that we are not alone. We have allies. We have each other. We each carry just a little of the load, Spirit, for we need each of us to keep us from giving up in this land of nightmares. In which it has been. Which is also the land of miracles, for this we know, for this we know. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. Please join me now in our prayer response. I know this rose will open. We hope all souls will unfurl their wings. When you give to our offering, 80% of your gift will care for the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair, and 20% will support our justice recipient. Our April Sharing Our Riches recipient is the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. NJEJA is the only statewide environmental organization that has a significant number of people of color in its membership and leadership. This diversity allows them to bring unique perspectives to issues that are otherwise absent. They have worked to prevent and reduce pollution, especially in underserved communities. And thanks to their efforts, there is now a New Jersey environmental justice movement and ensures that all New Jersey residents, regardless of their race, color, ethnicity, 
religion, or economic status are able to live, work, play, worship, and attend school in clean, safe, healthy, sustainable environments. You can text to give, mail us a check, or go to our homepage and click on the donate button. This is a time of need. All of your gifts are worthy, and they are all received with love. It's really important that communities have researchers and scientists that they can call upon to assist and support. And so over the years, we have these community university partnerships, and that's what I've been part of and have been pushing for the last four decades. Environmental racism kills. It makes people sick. The environmental justice movement grew out of the fight for civil rights and human rights. When we bring them all together, it's just one movement, the movement for justice. My name is Dr. Robert Bullard. I'm a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University. My job is to connect the dots between who gets what, when, where, and why when it comes to pollution. In 1978, what I found was that 100% of all the city-owned landfills were located in black neighborhoods here in Houston, Texas. I was able to document that the same pattern that we discovered in Houston was happening all across the South. And that's how the book Dumping and Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Quality was published in 1990. That was the first book on environmental racism and environmental justice. And what Dumping and Dixie research revealed to me is that it was not accidental, it was not coincidental. Systemic racism created these unequal, invisible communities that, that received the worst of the worst. And as I discovered, it was not just a Southern thing. Environmental racism was a national phenomenon. And as a matter of fact, it's international. Before COVID-19, communities of color were inundated with all kinds of environmental hazards and disparities. COVID-19 brought to the service the underbelly of what systemic racism is doing. We have two pandemics that's happening at the same time, the COVID pandemic and the pandemic of racism, and they both must be attacked at the same time.
Thank you so much, Marcus, Paul Black, and everyone who produced today's anthem. I begin with the wisdom of Yvonne Guevara, Brazilian Catholic sister and eco-feminist theologian who declares, we speak of the holy out of our personal experience. We seek the beauty of living beings and of all things because their beauty is a part of us. The divine lives in our relatedness to real things. This Earth Day, we examine how we approach something as massive as environmental justice. How do we begin to move hearts, minds, and policy on issues as global as climate change, pollution, and environmental racism? Perhaps we examine the particulars, real things in real places affecting real people. Perhaps we focus on details, specific locations, case studies serving as a microcosm of our journey because Environmental devastation is felt like all things at the local level, at the personal level, in the real, particular. Not everyone feels the same effects of pollution, dirty water, poisonous air, rising sea levels. This is also shown in medical studies revealing that rare cancers can form in clusters when certain subdivisions or even just one block in a neighborhood contain wildly disproportionate numbers of people with rare diseases. One such cluster was here in Montclair South End when a spike of osteosarcoma was linked to the dumping of radium from a glow-in-the-dark watch dial factory in Orange. And it is no coincidence that where that radium was dumped was inhabited predominantly by African Americans. This is what environmental justice seeks to highlight where racism, greed, and pollution collide in real places and real lives. Pollution is deliberately dumped in areas where the polluters believe they will get the least resistance. People and corporations made conscious choices to pollute certain areas in our world and not to pollute others. This is where the environmental justice work begun by Dr. Robert Bullard comes into focus. Dr. Bullard's work began in Houston documenting how all that city's dumps and most of its hazardous chemical plants were deliberately located in or adjacent to communities of color. The first time environmental justice was used to propel a movement was in Warren County, North Carolina in 1982. Looking to cheaply dump PCBs, a highly toxic compound, state officials decided on Warren County. The 70% black majority of Warren County organized in their churches and across their community. Yet, despite generous national press coverage of the issue, despite months of civil disobedience, the good citizens of Warren County were unable to prevent the PCBs from being dumped in their neighborhood. A conditioner and viscosity agent, PCBs were added to the oils electrical transformers were immersed in for cooling and insulation. They've polluted many places in this country. Curtis Bay in South Baltimore is a real place ruined for centuries by PCB pollution. Curtis Bay also shows the intersectionality of environment, race, and class. Curtis Bay is evenly mixed racially, and it is 
predominantly poor. The same sad tale can be told about the mostly poor black citizens of Flint, Michigan, whose water was deliberately polluted by, a gov by government officials in a sick effort to thwart local democracy and enable privatization of public water resources. I could go on. In response to these truths, we embrace a notion of a broad intersectionality, knowing we miss the call of justice unless we proclaim that racial justice is economic justice, is earth justice, is gender justice, and so on. I am proud that our off outreach offering recipient for March and April has been the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. A leader in environmental justice nationwide, two of their board members were recently invited to be part of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, guiding federal efforts to combat environmental injustice. So as we examine intersectionality, as we listen and learn how to focus our justice efforts to maximize our impact, let us remain aware of the particularity, the very local level at which environmental degradation is experienced. The environment surrounding any location is more fragile yet than the earth as a whole. And we experience that fragility, one dirty beach, one toxic waste dump, one black neighborhood, one unmanaged landfill at a time. So we must interrupt the production of toxic materials and greenhouse gases, eliminate any market demand for them, and prosecute as hate crimes those who poison poor and non-white communities with pollution. We must banish governmental cowardice in refusing to protect the environment we all share, living into our holy duty to leave to our grandkids a cleaner, more just world than the one into which we were born. The beauty of living beings and of all things is a part of the beauty within us. And that beauty is particular, intersectional, local, and fragile. Our anthem shared, nothing comes from violence and nothing ever could. Nothing comes from the violence that steals a beautiful life, a 13 year old life, a 20 year old life with a bullet and a gun. And nothing comes from the violence that desecrates with indifference or the violence that sacrifices some to bring comfort to others. Indifference and unholy sacrifice, that was what Reverend Scott was talking about. The violence at the intersection of racial and environmental injustice. Nothing comes from violence. Nothing. And our anthem adds, lest we forget how fragile we are. There is a lesson baked into this time of pandemic that I pray we do not forget lesson of our fragility. I pray that the vaccines, as blessed as they are, that they, even they, do not erase this lesson of our fragility. In the beginning of this pandemic, it was our elders and those most at risk who were the most aware of their fragility. And in that awareness, they took and begged for precautions that served us all. Now that most elders and the most at risk have received their vaccines, some, not in our congregation, but some are most comfortable, are the most comfortable easing those same restrictions that they had originally fought to enact, lest we forget how fragile we are. Acts, laws, practices that protect the most vulnerable save us all, full stop, no compromise. Reverend Scott has a nickname from his time on the job site as an electrician. No, Reverend Scott, not that one. <laughs> He was called the canary in the coal mine. When a toxic chemical was released, he was the first to feel its effect. His vulnerability due to asthma and allergies was initially laughed off as his workmates continued to labor. But then in 10 minutes or 20, they too started to feel ill or even worse due to the prolonged exposure. We ignore the most vulnerable at our own peril. The violence that affects some will affect all in due time, in due time. And what starts as a self-serving lesson, I protect my neighbor to protect myself, evolves into a theology of mutual self-care. When we commit to our neighbor, 
we commit to ourselves and the evolution of a holistic ecology for preserving life itself. There was a popular bumper sticker when I was coming of age. It said, the planet does not need saving, we do. The saying touched me because it acknowledged that the fragility was not out there, some kind of fragility baked into the planet, but in here, in all life of which we are a part. The planet will persist in some form long after we have made it unlivable. But we, we are the ones that cannot survive the violence that we do to ourselves. I was eager to plant seeds this spring, so eager to see them emerge from the winter soil that I planted some early enough that the young seedlings bore the challenge of frost not once but twice before the warm weather came. Some of these seedlings survived, but some suffered an early death. My eagerness was a kind of violence. I can be a mournful gardener. I know when I have bargained with life's fragility and lost. Among the survivors were the peas who are now nearly three inches high and reaching with ready tendrils to grab hold of the first rung of the trellis, steady and strong. I wove that trellis based on years of learning the proper way. And when stringing the trellis, I feel a partnership with the peas, with the life that needs my attention. I can also be a theological gardener, aware that planting, weeding, and reaping are ways to partner with life. How do we approach something as large as environmental justice? With the lessons that are close at hand, the lessons from our time of pandemic, the lessons that we learn as gardeners or as teachers, as parents or as children, the lessons that remind us of our fragility. The peas will thrive if I tend them, if I weave the trellis well, if I pair my strength and wisdom with their own. Earth justice is the same. And remember, racial justice is economic justice, is earth justice, and so on, which might at first seem to make the work even bigger, right? Out of reach, as if the problem is everything, everything. So where do we start? Well, we start right here, right here, because the problem is right here. If some of us can't breathe, we are all losing our breath. Even if we can't feel it, the violence is stealing life from all of us. So we need to start where we are planted. The problem is in the toxic dump in Newark, and it is in every justice act we are already working on. So get proximate, get close. Remember, racial justice is economic justice is earth justice. Enter the work from the place where you are planted and remember that what affects one affects all. Fragility is universal. Live and serve accordingly in whatever proximate ways you can. Amen. May it be so. Now please reflect with us. How will you protect the intersecting fragilities of community, human dignity, and even the fragility of the earth itself? Now, our closing hymn, Blue Boat Palm.
The beauty of living beings and of all things is a part of the beauty within us. And that beauty is precious, particular, local, and fragile. Government and industry must be held accountable for the pollution and injustice they create. As we listen and learn how best to heal our earth and our nation, let us always remember to highlight where the grave injustices of the world intersect. Fragility is universal. Racial justice is economic justice is earth justice. Enter the work from the place where you are planted and remember that what affects one affects all. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin. Go in peace. Go in joy. Go in Join us right after this for Connection Cafe, hosted by our 8th Principal Project team, as they lead us in a town hall. And pledge as you're able, if you haven't already. Until we meet again, virtually or otherwise, you are in our hearts.
Someday that I die.